a series of three courses that are going to cover all the chapters in Lessons for the Young Economist. They're, they're all called The Basics of Economics. Um, the first one is subtitled Action and Exchange, and that will cover chapters one through six. The second one is called The Free Market, and that will cover chapters seven through 14. And the third one is Government and the Market, and that will cover chapters 15 through 23. So I'd love to have a podcast with you about the other courses uh, in the future. In this podcast, it would make sense to talk mostly about the first course that's coming up that is going to um, cover part one, Foundations, which is chapters one through four, and part two, Capitalism, the Market Economy, the first two chapters of that part, chapters five and five and six. And so that's going to take the student from just the, the what we call the action axiom, just the, the, just the principle of human action, all the way through barter prices and direct exchange. Um, and so let, let's talk a little bit about um, the first chapter in part one, thinking like an economist. Um, what do you think is the um, characteristic way that economists think that um, people not trained in economics have a harder time thinking in that way? Well, I think um, first of all, it's it's a certain attitude or a perspective, a way of looking at the world, and that's what an economist brings to the table. And it involves things that you know, uh, trying to understand people's behavior and social outcomes as the result of intentional decisions by people. And so other mainstream textbooks, introductory textbooks, will try to capture it with phrases like saying people respond to incentives. Um, another way of thinking like economists is to say that people act on the margin or people make decisions on the margin. There are always opportunity costs. There's no such thing as a free lunch. right? So these are very popular sort of mainstreamy uh, free market ideas that certainly Austrians would endorse the, the content of those phrases. Um, but w what I notice is that uh, the, the more I work in economics, and I recently had a debate with David Friedman on, on methodology and economics, where I was defending the Misesian position, and and so as you mentioned, just going through the the text there, that we we do explicitly start from the fact of human action and then start deriving economic principles from there. And what's funny is most mainstream economists, that's one stumbling block for them where they say, yeah, you Austrians have a lot of good insights and we kind of like your business cycle theory perhaps or whatever. But wasn't that a weird obsession that this guy Mises and his followers had about economics is, is based on the action axiom and you know why can't we just be like the physicists and just have our, our theories and our principles and go, go test them against the data and that's, you know, we're scientific, right? But actually, just think of all those things I just said, that the, even the introductory mainstream textbooks, when they talk about what does it mean to think like an economist, to say you know, people respond to incentives, that's not something you go and test. You know, like if I said to you, here, I'll give you $20 if you chop off your left arm and you say, no thanks, I didn't just disprove that people respond to incentives. Clearly, as an economist, we just say, well, I didn't offer you enough. If I said, there's a million dollars, you know, and you, you might say, well, I'm right-handed, maybe I will, you know. So you, you see the point there. And things like to say there are, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Again, that doesn't mean that George Stigler went around surveying cafeterias saying, do you guys charge zero price for your lunches? That's, a, that's just a principle that means whenever there's a situation and something looks like it's coming for you know at no cost, really there's some trade-off involved. And that's all it means. And so it's not an empirical regularity that economists noticed. It's, a, it's an attitude. It's a way of saying, open your eyes to the full situation. And so that's what I mean, that every one of those bullet points that you'll see in a mainstream textbook saying, what does it mean to think like an economist? They are all what Mises would call a priori things that you know flow from the fact that, okay, if we're going to interpret social activity as being caused by people having goals and trying to achieve them, perhaps you know with the wrong expectations, then those standard thinking like an economist principles start popping out. Like that's why there's always an opportunity cost because if people are choosing, that means they're giving up something. And if they're choosing with intention, that means they have preferences and they value outcomes. And so necessarily to choose one and not the other means you're giving up what you could have done instead. 
So that's what it means for there to always be an opportunity cost coming with a decision. So that's, again, that's not something you go test. So it's that, that's kind of what we're trying to do in this book is to, to go through things and provide a, a coherent, um, broad education and what other economists would say, yeah, that's a fantastic free market education, but to sort of ground it in the Austrian perspective because the older I get, the more I realize that's why Mises did it that way because that really is the foundation of economics. That reminds me of uh, something that another non-Austrian free market economist um, said, Thomas Sowell would say, um, there's no such thing as solutions, there are only trade-offs or something like that. And um, and so that 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 gets at um, how Mises really thought of um, human action, the sciences of human action and, and economics as the the logic of choice. And um, he, he keeps talking about boiling it down to ultimately it's about someone choosing A and setting aside B. And um, what's beautiful about um, Austrian economics is that it's very thoroughgoing in, in applying that truth. And um, it just starts with that fundamental truth. And from that, it um, builds up the idea of preference rankings. Mm -hmm. um, and then from preference rankings, um, you can construct supply and demand schedules. And from supply and demand schedules, you can construct uh, price theory. And, um, and, and from and that's what that part is what's going to be covered in this course and then you know going from on from that from um prices and uh taking price theory and constructing a theory of profit and loss and about the market and in general um that's what future courses will cover um and um it's just really remarkable that how how well you uh bring that across in this book well thanks and yeah just to elaborate on that it's it really is amazing, as you say, that that, that Mises, you know, he realized no, just from that insight that humans act. I mean, in one sense, when I was younger, I didn't understand why he titled his book "Human Action." Like I said, why don't you call it, you know, principles of economic or economic laws or something? But now, of course, I get why he did that, and all these things, these issues in which Austrians tend to have battles with other economists, like you alluded to, one this issue about uh, preferences being ordinal and and utility ultimately being an ordinal thing, not cardinal. And that's something that Austrians have spilled a lot of ink over. But again, that's because Austrians are saying, well, no, if you're grounding economic science on the fact that people choose and you're looking at their action, well, then the only thing you can ever demonstrate with action is that something is better than another. You, you can't, you know, if I pick A over B, we can't say, oh, he valued A 16% more or A gave him 16% more utils than B. All you know is A was more valuable. A was higher on his preference ranking than B was. And, and so that's where the ordinal nature of preferences come in. And then like you say, it's um, it, that's surprisingly powerful. There's a lot you can explain everything in a market economy with that foundation. It's not that Oh yeah, you got to make all these other weird assumptions just to, to have something tractable to be able to build something like the mainstream economists might say. No, and, and even in this lessons for the young economists, like you alluded to, we go through and I have a simple little story about kids who after Halloween have candy that they're trading and I just show how market exchange ratios between Butterfingers and Snickers bars or whatever candy bars I used would emerge and all I all we have to deal with are the ordinal preference rankings of the students for the different types of candy. And then you can show this is how, you know, you put these kids together in a room and they start bargaining and these are the ways that prices would emerge. And we don't need to assume any kind of you know, cardinal utility functions, things like that, that what Mises says economics should be based on, that really is all you need to build up modern subjectivist price theory. And what's really great about that, not only because it's true, but it's also I think very easy to teach that, um, especially compared to um, the the sort of non systematic, non building up from uh, foundations up towards more complex um, a phenomenon. Um, that that that's something that kids are logical. That that um, kids you don't have to teach logic. That's just the way that. The human brain works, and um, and it used to be that um, every schoolboy and schoolgirl 
learned Euclid, l- learned um, geometry, um, starting from first axioms and building up to um, more complex um, uh, laws about geometry. Um, a lot of Austrians have talked about Austrian economics um, or, or the Austrian view of economics as being much more akin to geometry than akin to physical sciences. Um, and so, in terms of teaching um, students uh, about this system, sort of like this uh, intricate architecture of logic starting from the princi- principles and, and building systematically up from that, it seems that um, that especially online education where it's uh, time shifted, where the students can um, go back to the video whenever they want and really uh, spend as much time re-watching it as they need to and, and rereading and then and then only going on to the next video when they're actually re- ready for it. Um, that 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 you can really um, learn economics uh, thoroughly that way, the way that kids used to learn geometry all the time. Yeah, and it's a great analogy, and that even makes it into the lessons for the Iron Economist, where I use the analogy with the Pythagorean theorem to explain this is what we're doing with economics in this book, and you know, of course, based on the Misesian approach. And it, it's just funny. A lot of the objections people bring, you know, why why do we make that analogy all the time? It's because the objections of the critics who say things like, "What are you kidding me? You guys don't come up with falsifiable laws of economics that you go and look at the data or you run experiments to test? Were you crazy? That that's not scientific. You're just, you know, in, using mere tautologies. You're just walking around in a circle in your head with your own definitions. You're not learning anything about the real world. And so you say, okay, well, let's apply everything you just said to geometry. That you know, when when you show someone the proof of the Pythagorean theorem, that is theirs forever. It's not that they could wake up tomorrow and realize, oh my gosh, actually that that was wrong because someone shows me a triangle and I measure it, and it's oh gee, it's or you don't have to prove it by going out and measuring a thousand triangles and hopefully nine hundred ninety nine of them come re- reasonably close to what the th- the theory says. And so, but yet, does that mean therefore that ge- Euclidean geometry? is just a mere tautology and we're not learning anything about objective reality by going through it. And obviously, no, that's not true. That's why we make kids learn that stuff. They used to make kids learn that stuff. That's why it's it's considered, you know, Euclid's considered a genius and one of the most important contributors to modern civilization is because we know that that stuff, even though in a sense you could absorb Euclidean geometry just locked in a closet if you somehow had a method of, you know, going through the proofs in your head, yet that helps us navigate the real world. And so that's what economics is, that the stuff we teach in this book and the stuff that you know Mises taught in his books, it's you don't have to go out and test it empirically to see, wait a minute, does this guy make sense? It's all a self-contained logical system just flowing from the idea that humans act. But then once you've mastered those things, and they're not obvious too, just like the Pythagorean theorem is not obvious. When you, if I tell you the definition of a triangle and what it means for things to form an angle, it doesn't just pop out. Oh, clearly, the you know square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the square of the other two sides in a right triangle. That doesn't just pop out. You right. Have to be shown if, if somebody it. if somebody walked you through the steps of the proof of the Pythagorean theorem, it it wouldn't be valid for someone to to then say, why do you keep repeating yourself? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you're learning new things about reality by being. And same thing with economics. That it, you learn some, and that's hopefully you know, someone who takes these courses walks away knowing more about the real world, even though the way I communicated that was not to say, trust me, a bunch of economists have run experiments or we've done statistical analyses and we're pretty sure this is the way the world is. Here you go. We just saved you a bunch of work. That's not the way it works. We go through demonstration, like you say, even a child can follow the proof and then boom, if they get if the kid understands what I went through and understands each step of the argument, then that's his or hers forever. That you know now they can go and view the world through that lens, and doesn't that inspire hope? I mean, isn't it revolutionary the fact that just as in when when we had a uh, much better um, education system that um, school every schoolboy and schoolgirl could learn Euclid could could learn would learn the elements of Euclid, and and so the idea that 
if it was presented in um, a pedagogically efficient way, a very you know educationally effective way, that every schoolboy and schoolgirl now could understand the basics, the basic logic of of a market economy. Um, and when I say schoolboy and schoolgirl, I don't mean like kindergartners. Obviously, I mean like high schoolers and middle schoolers. Um, the audience, the the audience of the book, although um, adults are can get a lot out of this too. Um, but just the idea that um, that you know, conceivably, a whole generation of young people um, could learn uh, learn these principles, and and how much the world would be different if they did. How much the world would be different if if um, you know so many young people just grew up learning. Um, how a market economy works and the virtues of a market economy and um, and the folly of socialism and of inter interventionism. Yeah, it, it is inspiring and it, as I'm certainly not the first person to say this, just the possibilities of the internet and online education, just how now we don't need to take over you know, the Harvard and so forth, and all the government run schools and everything. Like, we can make sure the proper education, certain key ideas are getting out, and people can get that on their own time because now it's so cheap and it's so efficient to, to transmit it in terms of people's schedules that they can absorb that pretty quickly. And it's our job as educators to figure out different ways of how can we make this more understandable? How can we boil this down and get the essential message across? And as that happens, like you say, it's going to be harder for the government to enact all sorts of silly things. I mean, just to give you an example, with the Affordable Care Act, what's called Obamacare, I mean, I just did an article on that and I was just going to walk people through the logic of it. Well, you know, gee, if they're going to insist that insurers can't turn away people with pre existing conditions, then all sorts of things have to follow. They have to have minimum standards on the type of policy because otherwise the insurers would say, okay, yeah, well, you know, you got brain cancer, sure, we'll put you on our rolls and we'll cap it at $100 a year that we'll pay for medical expenses and your premium's $2 million. Sure, we can comply. So, you know, once you start down that path of trying to tinker with the market outcome, then the government necessarily is going to have to just do more and more and more. And then we won't be surprised five years from now when that system doesn't work as it won't. And then everyone's going to say, well, gee, clearly the free market doesn't work. That's why we need to have a single payer federal system in healthcare. So I'm just saying things like that, how do they get away with that? It's because the general public just, it's not automatic for them. Like it would take an economist to walk them through that. And then they might say, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. And so that's, and it's and off the public, if they just want to embrace socialism, okay. But the thing is, they don't want to. They didn't realize that this is going to be the outcome of what's been called Obamacare. They kind of just thought, oh, yeah, I'll get, you know, thank goodness, stick it to these greedy insurance companies. Or they might just say, well, you know, that's that's a complex subject. I don't really have an opinion on it one way or the other. So the more people who have just basic economic principles under their belt, they would understand, hey, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You can't possibly insure millions of people, give them more medical care, and then not expect spending on health insurance or health care to go up and so things like that and that gets at one of your sub chapters within the first chapter why study economics and i'm sure a lot of parents uh listening want to know how how can they motivate their kids to be interested in studying this in the first place yeah well i mean obviously it's in an interventionist economy such as we live in today, it's important because the government rams through all sorts of things. They're going to have horrible consequences because the, the masses are generally ignorant about these topics. And so that's the, you know, the, the primary reason in today's environment that people need to learn this stuff is so that they, first of all, don't fool for the politicians' empty promises, but also then they can go out and tell their friends and coworkers and so forth that, hey, did you ever think about this? And then, oh, gee, no, I never thought about it. You know, we need more people doing that sort of thing. Um, but also just beyond the pragmatic, I mean, it's just inherently a beautiful topic, like to understand how can it be that people acting in their own uh, interest, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're selfish, it just means acting according to their own purposes and there's all sorts of information and, and things out there that no one mind could possibly control 
and yet there's a way in which they all come together in the institution of private property and prices help them coordinate with each other and you achieve what if it were planned would be a magnificent unbelievable outcome and yet we just take it for granted because that's how well the market economy normally works when the government doesn't mess with it and so it's i mean just like you know someone why, why would you study how the human body works oh gee if there's an infection how does the body fix itself i mean that's fascinating just even if you're not planning on going into medicine it's just interesting to know that and the same kind of thing here that how is it that a market economy works and once you realize what it does every day it's it's amazing <laughs>